Oh my gosh, I miss y'all. I had to take off last week, but I'm back with Warrior Wednesdays. Come on into the room. Hey, I see you guys coming in. Hi, hi, happy Warrior Wednesdays. We are back. Um, and I just, I just want to say I miss you. Thank you to all of my friends, family, fellow warriors for the amazing birthday celebration that you guys were a part of. Hello, everybody. It made me feel so good. Ty, how are you, gorgeous? Everybody, let me know where you're from. I have this amazing guest coming on here today. Um, her name is Stacy Brown. She is a poet and a fertility advocate. And Stacy is going to be with me live when we do United for Resolve for National Infertility Awareness Week. I, darling, I am your host for Resolve United. And we are doing the thing. We have Ty Bo in the house. We have, um, you guys, let me know where you're from so we can bring Stacy on. And she's going to tell you a really powerful story about a diagnosis that she got when she was 25 years old called MRKH. I know a lot of you might not know what it is. I've done my research. Stacy brought it to me and, and I'm new to it. And let me tell you, it is a powerful story. So hello, Queens, New York. I see you in the building. Hello from Detroit. I see you here. Welcome. Mama Stu is here, y'all. Hi, Mama Stu, all the way from Philly. Dr. John Carroll is here. He is um, a really great half of Team Carroll. Dr. John Carroll is a fabulous educator. He also has a um, charity called Roots of Knowledge where he teaches brown kids um, about their heritage. So check out Dr. John Carroll's page in Roots of Knowledge. He's also married to a very, very good friend of mine and KG Carroll, who is the showrunner for All American, which I will be on next week. Oh, was I allowed to say that, John? I don't know, but what's going on, Tampa, Florida? Mama Stu, Ty says hello. Okay, everybody is coming in the building and I love it. And I am going to bring on Stacy Brown, like I said. I need you guys to do me a favor, though. You know how we get down here at Warriors. I need you to put a bunch of flowers on here. A bunch of flowers in the comments because this is one brave woman. And, and you are going to hear a miraculous story like you've never heard before. And so I want her to come on with flowers. So I need them to come into the comment section. I saw you from Detroit. Dr. John Carroll, get those flowers in from Roots of Knowledge. I want to see them like pop up in here, please. Hey, there they are. Phenomenally Autistic is in the building. Hello, Yanni. Thank you for being here. Infertility and Me Podcast. I need you on Warrior Wednesdays, Infertility and Me Podcast. So I'm going to hit you soon and we're going to do it. Julian Tillery is here. Flowers are coming. So let me get my girl, you guys. Welcome to the Warrior that we love, Miss Stacy. Brown, she's coming on with all of these beautiful things. It says it's waiting for her. So, oh, there you are. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Can you hear me okay? I can, yeah. Okay, I'm glad. I don't know why my AirPods are not like connected for some reason, but as long as you can hear me, that's what matters to me. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to beautiful Stacey Brown, beautiful poet beautiful person. I'm so glad that you're here. You're here from New York today, correct? Yes, I'm in Elmira, New York right now for, for residency. So, <laughs> yes. Okay, Elmira, New York. Well, I see my ex-boyfriend. I see I do this to him all the time. <laughs> Luis Alberto Laporte Jr., who is a Bronx boy. I see him in the building today. The Princess Warrior from the UK says, oh, she is beautiful. And yes, you are. And I believe that we have somebody in common, Miss Shakita Lockley, is that correct? Yes, yes, we do. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm, um, and I recently saw her on Instagram and I was like, I'm looking at the pictures and I'm like, I know her. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> exactly. Shakita Lockley, you guys created a film called Eggs Over Easy Film that I happen to have the pleasure of being in. And she also mentioned that she knows your lovely face. So I wanna get right into this, this conversation if, if we can. Um, first and foremost, uh, can you tell us, did you always want to be a mom? No, I don't, I, I don't, 
I don't know, honestly. Like, I don't know if now if I still want to be a mom. Um, I think it was like not thinking about being a mom until someone told me that I couldn't be one. Um, mm. It was kind of like, it, it was an option before, um, but knowing that I now have to take other avenues or, or to do something like that's more difficult or can seem more overwhelming to be able to have kids. Um, yeah, I wasn't. I, I wasn't even considering that. So it was in the it was in the thought process a little bit. I'm the oldest sibling and I was like, Y'all get on my nerves. Um, <laughs> so. That's under that's understandable. And since you you kind of you touched on it a little bit and you know what, I actually love the honesty of that answer. Um, because most of the women that I speak to, the first thing that they're gonna say is yes, and I feel like saying no is a very powerful truth that needs to be accepted and embraced and understood and not judged because we are women which means that we have the prerogative to change our minds and yeah. so i love that that wasn't something that you tried to give the right answer because we are women but can you tell everyone your story so um Something happened at 25 years old, but before you tell them what you heard at 25 years old, can you give us a little bit of a history of your body in terms of cycles and things like that growing up? Yes, of course. So um, with MRKH, you don't have a uterus, so I never had a cycle. And I wasn't necessarily pressed to get one. Um, it wasn't something that I was like really looking forward to or um, like my friends would talk about it and I would just be like, huh, huh, yeah, that happens to me too. And kind of just playing it off until, you know, I, I was able to get comfortable with a group of women who are like my, you know, my friends still now, um, to be able to say like, actually, no, I don't have one of those. Um, wow. And wow. like the, the whole process of like being asked, like, do you like till still today, it's being asked, like, do you have a pad and, and all of those things? And it's like, no. Um, and, and I just, I just didn't feel pressure. I didn't have any physical symptoms, like I wasn't in any amount of pain. And so I was like, this doesn't sound fun. This sounds really scary. And I didn't necessarily want to, want to be a part of that. Um, so that was for a long time, I, I went without being diagnosed because I was like, I'm, I'm okay with not having one. I didn't necessarily see it as a red flag. It wasn't educated or I wasn't taught that it was a red flag either. Um, so. And that's really, really key to say, but I do want to get into what your diagnosis actually was at 25, because a lot of people don't know. But it is, it is true that sometimes when we don't have our period or we have irregular periods, we normalize that, right? And it's because it's the body that we're living in, it's the life that we're living, and we don't always talk to our sister girlfriend about what's going on. But you were diagnosed with something called MRKH, you guys, MRKH at age 25 years old. So for those of us that don't know, can you tell us what that diagnosis is? All righty. So MRKH stands for Maya rukatansky kusterhauser syndrome. And it's a rare syndrome that affects one in 5,000 women where you're born without a uterus and with an underdeveloped vaginal canal. Um, and so it was, it was very difficult finding out that at 25, I was born with something. Um, mm -hmm. And even the doctor that I discussed my, that, you know, gave me the information, couldn't even give me that answer. He's like, yeah, you know, it looked like something was developing in utero, but didn't develop all the way. And I'm just kind of like, so you mean I was born with that one? And he's just like, he's like, I can't answer that. I can't, I can't give you that information. Um, which was, which was very hard because it's like, wow, here I am, this very rare diagnosis, and you didn't even take the time to do the research on your end to be able to communicate it with me. Like, you just, you just showed me the results, and that was it. Um, and it's, it's interesting because at 18, I did have an ultrasound, and I had a nurse who was like, she looked stunned, and she was kind of confused, and... Um, and she was like, yeah, I, I don't see a uterus, but I think you're just constipated. Like, I think you're just, you're just backed up. And it Okay, I'm gonna back up a little bit. So you had an ultrasound at eight. So I, I just want to make sure that our audience understands because first and foremost, you are so brave. Thank you. you are exceptional. Um, and you are 
beyond helpful to the community right now. I see my sister is here, Niecy Nash is in the room, and, and I see, like I said, Princess Warrior from the UK, Mama Stu is here. We're all throwing love your way. Shakita is in the room. But mm -hmm. I, I just wanna be clear that everybody understands because what your, what your diagnosis says is that you were born without a uterus, so without an actual womb and yes. the fallopian tubes and everything that goes around that as well as an underdeveloped vaginal canal. So the birthing canal, the vaginal canal by which we have intercourse, if we choose to have intercourse with a penis, um, was underdeveloped. And when you were 18 years old, um, you're, you're saying that you had an ultrasound where the doctor said, I don't see a uterus, but maybe you're just constipated. Yeah, she was like, maybe you're just backed up. Like, I think, like, I think it's, you know, I like kind of blew it off. And it's, it's very interesting with me now, like working in allied health and as a resident. And, and I see so many times where I don't know something, where I ask for another opinion. And it's kind mm -hmm. of like, I've taken the time to ask for another opinion. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I would have, I could have known at 18 compared to knowing at 25. Um. But it is not your fault because the reality is the healthcare uh, doctor that was, that was with you should have done more, should have done the research, should have sent in specialists and done more. And, but this is one of the things that we talk about here on Warrior Wednesdays is that we do have to be in a position of advocacy. But one of the things I wanna offer you now because even for my mom, my mom is here 77 years young and beautiful. When we don't know that this condition even exists, how do you know the questions to ask? Yes. How do you know what you're supposed to be, you know, probing about? You don't even know. So this is not on you, dear sis. This is not on you. And, and this, what you are doing in this moment is educating a whole lot of people, whether they are not mothers or, or want to be mothers, or you're, you're educating us in a way where MRKH, I'm almost certain. Everybody that's in the chat right now, can you let us know if you have ever heard of MRKH syndrome by giving us a thumbs up that you have heard of it or a thumbs down? Because my guess is we're going to see most thumbs down. But because you are here in this moment, mm -hmm. in this moment, all of these people in this room, the next go around are going to understand that this is here. So we're 18. We have an ultrasound. And I say we because you are part of the community, sis. Just yeah. FYI. <laughs> so we have an ultrasound at 18. And then at 25, a doctor tells you you don't have a uterus. How emotionally does this make you feel? It was, uh, it was, a, and I, honestly, it was a lot of rage. Um, I was very angry just because of the way that he shared the information with me. Um, I was in grad school at the time when I found out. So it was like in between doing school and going to the doctor's appointments and, and all of this. And his, his office was in the same building that my classes were. And so it, what, he could have simply called me upstairs to have this conversation in person, but instead chose to do it over the phone. Instead came to me and was like, well, you don't have a vagina. Um, came to me with very little information, explained what was going on. Um, immediately threw surgery at me. He's like, yeah, there's a surgery that you can get that is similar to a gender reassignment surgery where you can create a vaginal canal. Um, and accused me of already knowing just because of the experience that I had when I was 18. Um, so yeah, I was angry. I was mad. I was, I'm, I, I'm pissed for you. I'm, I'm enraged for you. And just so you know, there was a bunch of thumbs down, meaning people had never heard of MRKH. So we thank you. Immediately, we thank you for bringing us into the world because you are us and, and we are you. And I understand to the best of my ability, your rage and you have every, every right to be. 
And so in that journey of hearing all of this, now you're deciding, are there steps to take forward? I know that he said that there was a surgery. So I did a little bit of research since we spoke. And I know that there is um, a vaginal reconstructive surgery where the, they, they do something with the pelvic lining skin and they can, they can attach the bladder in a way. Um, how was the process of just trying to learn about MRKH? How was that process for you? Um, it, was, it was very isolating, um, mm. overwhelming. Uh, even like learning about the surgical options. I personally had a bunch of surgeries for several different reasons. So like wanting, deciding if I wanted to put my body through that. Um, mm -hmm. It was, it was a lot of, I get, it was, it was very difficult for me to even view myself as a woman or to even feel like feminine or beautiful or sexy. Like I would put on a crop top and like jeans, like something that I would feel really cute in. And I would put it on, I would just be like, no, like, I, it, it, I was kind of disgusted um, in a way. And it was, it was just a lot of information all at one time. And I, I've learned now to take it in, in parts and in doses. Um, mm -hmm. But it was, it was just, it was a lot. And I was in school and I was so focused on being in school because that was my priority. And I literally took all of my emotions towards MRK and I was like, I just can't, I can't deal with this right now. Like I have, I have other things to do right now. Like I can't, I just can't do this. And so my emotions were like, I'm here. I'm showing mm -hmm. up or not. Like you're, you're dealing with me right here, right now. Um, and so it was, it was definitely a very like emotional crying on the floor type of moment because I was officially died. It was like a day before my final that I was officially diagnosed with the Mark age because I had, I had gone to another doctor for another opinion. May I offer you, and I'm, I ask it as a question, but may I offer you my voice in this? Yes. May I tell you in front of everybody in this room, and I know that they will amen it. May I tell you that you are very much a whole woman. You lack nothing in the word, in the spirit of woman. You are all of the things that we, that may have been born with something, took for granted. And the fact that you can sit here bare bone to us and share something that, like I said, most people here had never heard was a syndrome. Baby, when I tell you that makes you more of a woman, your parts are not what makes you a woman. The same way whether you birth a child is not what makes someone a mother, whether someone gives sperm doesn't make them a father. So I hope that you hear the voice that I asked if I could offer you that woof, <laughs> what a capital W woman you are. <laughs> and so tell us now, woman, <laughs> and you guys write it in, write it in the chat because you know how we do here on, on warriors. We, one of the things that I said to Stacy this morning while we were having our, our talk is that um, I was doing an interview once with um, a publication and I won't name who, um, but it was during, um, after George Floyd in, in June of 2020. And it was a, the person that was writing the article was, was a white woman. And she wanted my input about what it felt like being a black woman in the world of infertility. And she was writing it and I was offering comments to it. And one of the things when I read the proof was one of the first st statements she made was, you know, as a white woman, I will never experience this. This isn't my story. 
So I can't really say much, but that's why we have Kelly Stewart. And I called her and I said, you lost me at, as a white woman. Mm -hmm. And the reason I said that is because she separated herself from the experience and made it, this is a black woman's problem. And what I said to her is, this is, I am a woman. So if I am being discriminated against as a woman, then so are you. Because what happens to any woman should happen to you. And so I say to you, you are a woman. MRKH, I own that too. As a woman, you're not alone in this. So don't let anybody separate you from the tribe of women that we are. Now, I want, I want you to, to tell us, what do you do? What do you do for a living? So you said you were in school and you work in the medical community, correct? Yes. So what does Miss Stacy do other than spit poetry? <sighs> so much. Um, <laughs> so I, I might got my master's at Northwestern um, in Chicago in prosthetics and orthotics. So prosthetics are artificial limbs. Um, orthotics are any, is any type of supportive bracelet for the body. Um, so after school, after you graduate, you then do residency. So you do a year for orthotics and a year for prosthetics. And so I am now in the residency process. Um, so it's, 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 such, it's such a giving field. Um, and just being able to help people and, and being able to give back in that way. And I'm really big on like healthcare disparities and, you know, promoting diversity and inclusion and equity in our, in our profession. So I've, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm glad you guys give her some clap hands because I, what we can really take from this, as I told you earlier, is that God doesn't give these fights to, to the soldiers that aren't going to win the war. And so you oh. have been chosen. There's, there's a quote that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Ooh. He qualified the called. So even with this diagnosis, as you walk through this journey, you become more and more qualified to shine through MRKH and not hide through it. So it, it means it makes so much sense to me that you work in a field of helping other people in the healthcare industry. That makes so much sense to me because it's in full alignment. You're getting a whole lot of clap hands from Michelle Polston from her normal, the princess warrior. They're, they're all clapping you up, sis, as they should, and, and calling you pure magic. So what we would love to know and, and, and really need to know is what, what should we know about MRKH? Let's say you're talking to someone that has no idea that it even exists. As you've process this and continue to, what do we need to know that we don't know? Um, I think it's important to know about MRKH. There's several layers that are involved. Um, so it, it, it is, you know, questioning if you're a woman, it is kind of filling out war with your body. Um, it is the infertility. It is deciding if I'm going to be a mom, how am I going to be a mom? Like it, it's, it's several, several layers and several things and a lot of pain, but also a lot of healing. Um, and, and that it's just, just being labeled as something rare um, that from the beginning puts a type of isolation on it. And it makes mm -hmm. you feel like alone from the beginning. And just like realizing that there is a community just all over the world of women with MRKH um, and and just like that there is there's still power in that and power within that community and also like you you feel like your your body has betrayed you in a sense because it decided something for you mm. that like you're uh, you were you know you're created this way and you know you're born without a womb and so it's it's really it's processing that pain processing the, for me the guilt um around being 18 and having the opportunity to find out at 18 but like you said if you don't know 
like what can you do and so it's it's also realizing like how I, I i couldn't you know to myself that it was difficult for me to advocate for myself as a black woman but it was also difficult difficult for me to advocate for myself as a child because mm. like, you're still like <laughs> you're not fully an adult you think you're grown but mm -hmm. um and so that's that's the biggest thing is just the the emotions behind it and a lot of things that we we have to go through and we and we push through and overcome um, is, and you push through and you overcome and and just to clarify for for those ovaries yes so we have ovaries we have ovaries and remember i'm saying we we <laughs> have ovaries so the womb that develops because we do know here on warriors um we work with dr cindy m duke we love her she's on vacation y'all and i really want you to talk to her yeah. if you're open to it because she's fabulous but one of the things we learn is how the womb actually how those two portals come together and they open up and create this and that some women are born with what's called a unicornet uterus where there's only half and so there's not enough space for a baby to grow that some women are born without a womb or a uterus mrkh but have ovaries some women are born with a womb without ovaries so you have ovaries yes yes and does does that mean that you have eggs yes yes i do okay <laughs> y'all so i i just want y'all to understand that so you have your eggs, right? So there are options. So for those people that maybe in the future get a diagnosis similar to, to yours that have ovaries, can, and, and, but without the uterus, can you explain um, what some of the options may be to motherhood if someone chooses to try? Honestly, I would have to do, like, I know the, the, foundation of IVF and surrogacy and, and adoption as well. Um, I haven't really done a bunch of research on that just because it's it's very difficult right now for me to view myself as a mom, for me to imagine myself being a mom. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just like I, I recently was sharing my story and poetry. I've been exposed to this amazing community of like people just all over the world who are going through this this process. Um, so I've been able to learn things from them. And it's and I have to I have to take it step by step because it becomes a little overwhelming. Because it, it becomes this like why me? Why am I in this and like why why did God pick me um to to be in this position and and speaking of God, I'm very honest with God. And I'm Oof. like Tell I'm me. Like I'm upset. I like I don't I don't know what the the purpose is within this. It's very difficult for me to understand the purpose within this. Um, and there are even some times where it's like I'm grateful, but I'm grieving. Like mm. I'm over this expectation, I'm grieving over something that I see on social media all the time um, with either announcements or, you know, first like birthday parties and all of these events that people that they have with their kids, like I'm, I'm grieving that. Um, mm. And so I've just, I've decided to invite God to grieve with me um, because, because <laughs> <laughs> like, you this know, is. in this together, if you have a plan and a purpose for this, we we doing this together. So whether if that means like reading a scripture or just talking to God and journaling and being very, very honest. Um, I, I'm breathing and I know everybody that's watching it is going through it too. When you said grateful, but grieving, it's, it's so real. And I, I honor you and I lift you up in this moment because you're willing to not be okay all the time. Yes, yes. And you're willing to say that out loud because each step that you take in whatever direction of your life 
first of all, the steps are going to be forward. Yes. God put you here. So I know you said, what is the purpose for this? But as long as there's breath in your body, mm -hmm. you are in purpose. And sitting here having this conversation, you are in purpose. You are in purpose with me, with everybody here. And, and I honor that because I can't imagine what it takes to open up about this. And so you are in purpose. But to be able to say, grateful but grieving I think is almost like the marquee of the infertility world you know we always say it's this club that we're that we don't want to be in but with the best members yes, yes. because we don't make it nice <laughs> all the time mm -hmm. and and talk to us a little bit more about that statement because you are a poet so you use words right mm -hmm. and and you tap into the meaning and the texture and the nuances of all of that so tell us about that intersection of grateful but grieving like uh, what it means to you it actually came to me it was like thanksgiving day um and i'm here in elmira like away from my family and COVID and all this was happening and I wasn't able to go home. Um, and it was just feeling like I really needed community and I was missing that. And I think, you know, with, with being positive and uh, all these things about, you know, toxic positivity, it kind of becomes this thing like, oh, just be grateful. Like, why are you sad? You should be grateful. As if like my sadness and my grief automatically equates to me being ungrateful and that's and I think in in that moment like I realized that that like grief and and gratitude can coexist in the same space and that they don't have to be two separate things like you can be thankful and have grief you can have you know and and like those those can exist together and that it doesn't yeah. Like your your pain doesn't make you ungrateful. You're processing something and you don't have to be okay. And it is extremely exhausting to try to be okay all the time. But that's what mm -hmm. the world tells you. Like you're going through this thing through infertility where there's adoption. Well, there's, sorry, there's these options. So you have options, so be grateful. Why are you sad? So be grateful. You like you have choices, so be grateful. It's mm -hmm. like this for one, I already know what the choices are, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, wait, 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 pause because we do this all the time on Warriors and we and we love this because there are so many people. Now, did you share your diagnosis with many people or was it something that you kept private? Um, I shared it with my like with my family at first in the beginning it was my family and my close group of friends. Um, and then eventually I was able to find an amazing support group um, that I then I was able to share it with them and share my experiences with them. So at first, what's was, the name of the support group? Is there is it an online group or is yeah. it a support group? What's this the is, name of the support group? So it's called Sisters Survivor and Infertility. So S I S T A H S. Um, there's an Instagram page, there's a Facebook page, and I can, I can give all that information to you, Janae. Cook yes, we at Warriors, we want to, we want to get familiar. So she, uh, she is the, the founder of the group and it's been such an amazing group, um, full of very supportive women who have literally become my sisters, like there. And, you know, and we talk about everything. We talk about dating, we talk about like how our day was and, it's such a safe space and I'm just so like, I'm just really big on, on being a part of safe spaces and creating them. Um, yeah, so it's it's been a, a blessing in my life and they're just, I love them so much. <laughs> I love that. Yes, we, we well, we're gonna borrow you too because, <laughs> and, we, and we at Warriors wanna be, Sisters Surviving Infertility, I see that from pretty much Mika. Is that the creator? So the support group 13 um that okay so um okay a page up there <laughs> well i want to go back to what you said though when you said first of all i already know what the options are and i love that because they're triggers right they're triggers. and that's 
they're mm -hmm. triggers. And that's why I asked you who you may have shared it with, because oftentimes it's people that we, that love us, people that want something for us without even asking whether we want it or not. That's why I always start off with, did you always want to be a mom or no? You know, because we can't then start to infiltrate what options, which we all know we have, um, when we don't even know what that person's intention in their life is. So how, how have you dealt with the triggers? Because we talk about that a lot here on Warriors, our different ways. Some of us just go all ham on somebody. Yeah. Some of us sometimes get a little bit insular and, and have to go through a different type of process. All are understood and all are supported. But how do you deal with, with the triggers that come up, whether that's baby showers or somebody telling you what your options are like you don't know? And how do you deal? Honestly, I'm still learning. It's still a process. Mm -hmm. um, but I realized in the beginning of this um, that I have to, in order to be able to heal um, and respond, not necessarily in a different way, um, but where maybe it doesn't hit as hard is that I have to allow a trigger to be triggering. So mm -hmm. I have to allow that trigger to, to make me feel the way that I feel and then process those emotions with it. Because if I don't do that, then I can identify it. I can't like, I remember my cousin, um, she had a baby shower and it was like my first baby shower after being diagnosed and spending the whole day like, I got this, it's good, I'm gonna be fine. Like, everything's gonna be fine. And then I went to the baby shower and like seeing her and her kids and just how beautiful she was, I was like, I, I like broke down in the car because it was, it was so much that I wasn't necessarily prepared for. My best friend is in the comments. Um, <laughs> let's pop off for me, she does. She's like, I will- Yes, I best friend. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I will post something and she will look in the comments for me. Like usually I'll post up and I'll like put my phone away. But Shannon looks in the comments for me and she I um, get it. She will my, address Mama Stu does that. Yes. My sister does that. I you are, listen, everybody needs a pop off friend, okay? Yes. Everybody needs a everybody needs a friend. We all we all need that. So good. Yes. good. She gets them because sometimes I'm a very late responder. So I'm the type of person where like, you think of a comeback in the shower hours <laughs> after it happened. So <laughs> that's, that's me. Um, but it's, it's, it's processing them and also processing them in different situations in different places at work is different. Um, at work, everybody wants to bring up kids. Do you have kids? Are you gonna have kids? Um, like, and I remember having a conversation with someone and talking about my siblings. And I know she was just making small talk, um, but she was like, you know, in your situation, you would either have five kids or have none. And it like, I was, I was like sitting there trying to hold it together during this appointment with, with the patient because I'm like, in my situation, like I can't give birth, like there are, there are none that I can give birth to. Um, <laughs> But I didn't like, I didn't know how to verbalize that in a professional setting. I didn't know, I didn't know what to say. I did like eventually cry at the end of my appointment, at the end of their appointment. And um, like my manager came to me and asked what's wrong and I was able to talk to him about it. Um, but it's, 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 it's kind of crazy. And I think it's, there are things and comments that we think would be reassuring and helpful that are not. Um, like saying that I can adopt or saying that, you know, there are these other options, they're not helpful because it's not, these are not quick fix solutions. And like, this isn't a quick fix solution to my grief either. Like, that, that doesn't <laughs> make me, you know. Um, yeah, because oftentimes people will ask questions or make suggestions, but they don't have to deal with the consequences of the answer. That's it. They don't have to deal with the consequences of that suggestion. Yeah. And like I said, we are one, you're not alone. Because in, in my circumstance, for instance, having frozen eggs and then being of a certain age, people, even in my family, 
like around the Thanksgiving table will say, well, what are you going to do? When are you going to defrost these eggs? We want to see a baby. And I'm like, I froze my eggs to take the pressure off. So right. I'm not going to let you take, put it back on. Mm -hmm. And that question came from someone that was a woman. And it mm -hmm. usually is a woman um, that was married with three children. So you've already got the thing, three of the things, and you're not even realizing that that is triggering me. And the reality is the way, the way you were diagnosed and the way that it was brought to you is traumatizing. That's trauma. Yes. And, and I think it's so important that we identify that, that we like attach the word trauma to that because I, for me personally, at for so long, I wasn't because I thought it was like, oh, this exaggeration in a sense, like, oh, I'm, I'm being dramatic in a sense with using that word, but you're not. It's traumatic. It's, it's trauma. It's traumatic. It is an event that happens that sets you off your footing. And everything you do moving forward in life is you trying to regain a new footing with this, with this understanding that this is something you will always carry with you. Mm -hmm. It is the same for someone that grew up with abuse in their childhood and, and knowing that that abuse happened, it's never going to go away, but finding a footing and understanding it's with you and understanding that that's, that's trauma. So right. I'm glad that we identified it that way. And I'm glad that you take your damn sweet time oh, yes. processing it yes. as long as you need for the rest of your life, even if it's until God throws dirt on your face. Yes. It's, this is your life. Yeah. This is your story. And you live it the way you choose. Mm. And you continue to let that pop off friend deal with people on your behalf. And, and I, we laugh about it, but the reason that I say that is because sometimes being a full woman, we want to be a martyr in all things. We want to say, I got it. I'm okay. Knowing I ain't okay today. Right. Knowing I don't feel strong today. And sometimes we have to permit ourselves to pass the baton to someone else that can hold space for us, mm -hmm. that can pop off or say, she's not all right, leave her alone, or it can tell you to go outside, I'll handle this. Yeah. We, as the traumatized person, need to let ourselves be helped. Need to let ourselves be helped. So yeah. give yourself permission to not be the one that always has to take the trigger on. Mm -hmm. Give yourself permission to ask for help when needed. And when we talk about help, I want to talk a little bit about um, poetry, mm -hmm. poetry, because we talked about art and the healing of, of art. So when did poetry come into your life? Because you have some, she has a poem she's going to spit, y'all. And I, and I really, really can't wait. And a beautiful poem that resolve on April 22nd, you guys, we are going to be live at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we are going to see your poem at United for Resolve that's honoring National Infertility Awareness Week. You just heard me go into my whole hosting voice. But I want to talk a little bit more about your, your poetry. And, and then I'm going to maybe play a little game with everybody that's in the comments, that comments here. Um, but tell us how you became into the poetry world, poetress. So I, like, you couldn't tell me when I was a little kid that I wasn't going to be a singer, that I wasn't, like, Beyonce and write music. Um, <laughs> so I would, like, I would, like, write songs. And, and like, you know, that's essentially a, a form of poetry as well. And so I just, I kept writing because it was, it was so sacred. Because you're, like, you're, you're pausing. You're making time for yourself. You're 
you're being honest with yourself. And I feel like, oh, get emotional. Um, good. But I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, it good because listen, when it, where it flows, that's where God is. When we stop the flow of it. Yes. We're telling God, I don't want you to get too real with me. So when the emotions flow, that's where God is. That's where your pureness is. That's where his voice is. Mm. That's where your purpose is. Yes. And that, and that is, um, that's why I write. Because sometimes I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. I don't know if I want to pop off. I don't know if I want to cry. And it's like God literally gives me the words every single time. Um, and he just like he like he puts it in a way that I can understand, that I can be honest with, that I can then share with other people to then be able to help somebody else. And it's like it's all God. And I, and there's some days where I'm like, I haven't written in a long time. I really need to write. And like something happens, and I'm like in here. I'm like in the shower. I'm driving somewhere, and it's it comes to me. And I'm like, that's nothing but God. It's nothing but God. Um, but yeah, poetry is, is definitely helped me redefine what it means to be a woman because the world's definition does not include me. And it doesn't include Wait, stop right there. <laughs> Nichelle Polston, can you do me a favor, my warrior friend? Because I know you're either at your computer or you got a pen or a paper somewhere. What we're going to do is Michelle, Nichelle uh, from her normal, also a board member on Resolve. Um, so she will be there. Um, can you write down what you just said, what what Stacy just said? You said, um, tell me the, the sentence you just said about this, defining a woman. The world's definition of a woman does not include me. The world's definition of a woman does not include you. Is that um, Is that in a poem that you wrote? No, that's just something that... Perfect. <laughs> the world's definition of a woman does not include me. Nichelle Polston, can you please write that and put it in the question portion? Because what we're going to do is we're going to have three ladies, three warriors that are here, add a sentence to that. And we are going to write a poem for Stacy, starting with that line. The world's definition of a woman does not include me. So Nichelle Polston is gonna start it off by putting that sentence, if you can, Nichelle, into the question portal. And then what I want is for everybody that's on here, I'll, I'll choose three others, but to add a sentence to that. And then after, when we're about to close out, cause we gonna hear you spit. <laughs> when we're about to close out, we are going to give you a poem for today. So the world's definition of a woman does not include me. Nichelle's going to put that in there. And then I need you guys to add to it and put it in the question portion um, as if you're asking me a question. Now, okay, so it's all God. God gives you the poetry. But, but we know, we know, and I just said this to the Princess Warrior before, I came on live today. I had to do a COVID test for the show I'm shooting. And child, I got here like at th my time, 3.31 exactly, which is why my ear pods on here. But I had just said to her, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. So you do the work. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's God. But you are surrendering to him and letting those words come out. So will you spit a poem for us while we create a poem for you. So I, I need y'all to add to that first line that Nichelle's gonna put in the chat in, in here for me. But give us, let me, let me sit back here. And, right. and give us, let's give, a, let's give her flowers again, you guys, so that there's love in this room, but I just wanna hear your heart. Okay. <laughs> um, this is actually something I haven't released yet. Um, I'm planning on creating a visual for it, but it's, it's in the works. Um, so this is called Grief. It says, um, I found joy in her laugh. 
I found joy in her smile. I found comfort in the way her tiny little hands hold on so tightly to mine. I found joy in a child. And a part of me felt guilty. And I didn't want in my cage to take this joy away from me. I wanted to feel this joy for as long as I possibly could. I didn't want to think about what could be and be angry about what should be. I didn't want to think about those scary decisions that lie ahead of me. Right now, my only options are adoption and surrogacy because I had joy and I am deserving of joy. And I wanted to cry because I'm not grieving the fact that I will never be a mom. I'm grieving the joy that I might have found in her life. I'm grieving the joy that I might have found in her smile. I'm grieving the comfort that I might have found in the way that her tiny little hands would have held on so tightly to mine. I'm grieving an expectation. Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful, beautiful. The last line, I'm grieving an expectation. Let me just tell you how much that moved me. That was beautiful. And I want you to know, because this is what real art and poetry does. It reminded me of a conversation I had with Mama Stu. Mm -hmm. And it was a hard conversation. Mama Stu just wrote, I am done. <laughs> it was hard because I had to try to explain to my mother that I had to mourn. Yes. Yeah. The fact that it didn't happen the way I wanted it to. Yes. The way I thought it would. The way that and like. It's really hard. It's, it's hard. It's hard. And it was really hard for my mom at the time to accept that because she felt like I was giving up. Mm. But I needed her to let me give up. Right. Right. I didn't want to be strong. And I didn't want to say, to your point, I know I could do surrogacy. I know I could do adoption. I needed her to let me mourn. The reality that I am childless. And when you said that line, I was grieving expectation. That's the truest moment there. Because that reminded me of them at that moment with my mom of that's what I was grieving. Expectation is hard. Hope is hard. It's hard. But this is why we do this, so that we know we are in community with each other. And we know that we experience similar tears, maybe for different reasons, but our cheeks are still wet. Yeah. You know? So thank you for that beautiful piece. I can't wait to see a, a visual to it. Hell, I'll star in it. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let me go ahead and book me on a job. One of your one of your poems. Nichelle Poston says, Grieve your expectations and the expectation of others. Yes. Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? All right. So it's real. I am gonna go in these questions and see if we have a poem in here yet. Okay. Starting with um what Nichelle would have put down. All right. Oh, Lord, I love my warriors. So I'm going to need somebody with a pencil to, like, write this down for me. Nichelle or um, Rihanna. Y'all know who y'all are. Okay, so here we go. The first line. The world's definition of a woman does not include me. The world's definition, I think it should say of a woman, right? Does yeah. not include me. All right, that's the first line. Thank you, Nichelle Poston, from her normal board member. Whew. 
Here comes the second line. Princess Warrior. But yet I am created for my father's pleasure. But yet I am created for my father's pleasure. Somebody write that down for me. I the love um, Go ahead. I always, like whenever I'm having, you know, whenever I got to pull God aside sometimes, I'm, I'm always like, was being fearfully and wonderfully made, was MRK a part of that? Woo! And like, that right there is like, yes, like, yes, it was. Like, yes. Like, it was. Come on, y'all. Uh, yes, yes, it was. But yet, I am created for my father's pleasure. But yet, Nichelle says she is recording this so we have our poem together. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. This is from the hood, Byron, but the God I serve decided to create me uniquely. But the God I serve decided to create me uniquely. The definition of a woman does not include me, but yet I am created for my father's pleasure. And the God I serve decided to create me uniquely. Mm. Here's the last, last line from Jen Rob Hurd. I'm so much more than the world can handle. I'm so much more than the world can handle. The definition of a woman does not include me, but yet I am created for my father's pleasure. And God decided to create me uniquely. I'm so much more, so much more than the world can handle. Oh, that's Thank you, my warriors. I love y'all. We were <laughs> not going to let you just feed into us we i will write that poem down i will send it to you but we were not going to let you feed into us without us feeding right back into you you miss stacy brown poet uh resident <laughs> black woman warrior are absolutely divinely and wonderfully and purposefully made purposely made and I treasure and I honor you and I I cannot thank you enough for blessing this space and I want to say to you personally for trusting me to create a space for you to to share your truth with us and to educate us and to bless us and to remind us that we are each other yeah. So I absolutely, absolutely honor and treasure you. And I thank you. Thank you. I thank you. I enjoyed this. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, uh, this is what I needed. <laughs> I'm so glad it's what we needed too. Mama Sue says, Stacy, love you. Perfectly <laughs> made. There's a lot of amens. So as we, as we let you go on the East Coast and we will put all of this, the poem together, uh, pretty much Mika says, love you, Stacy. Brian says, love you, Stacy. Look at all that love. People are saying thank you. You guys put a bunch of um, flowers in the chat. This, the way that we brought you on is the way that we're going to send you to your dinner time and your bedtime. Uh, Nichelle Polson, board member of Resolve. She is all women. She is all things that so she's going to send the poem momentarily. And she will. <laughs> um, so you guys, again, this is Stacy Brown. Put the flowers in the chat and we thank you. Just so you know, Stacy and I both are part of United for Resolve for National Infertility Awareness Week. You can sign up at resolve.org. They are on the chat right now. Go to Resolve's page and you can go to the link. And I also think that the link is in your um, on your handle as well. Follow Stacy, y'all. Support her support her causes, support all of her poetry, the things that she does. April 22nd, 8 p.m. 
for National Infertility Awareness Week. I will be your host. Stacy will be dropping poems at United for Resolve. Sign up and yes. join us while we honor all of our stories. And that's what the night is really going to be about, is stories, is things like this. So we thank you. We honor you. Woo, honey, you are everything. Thank you. You are everything, and you are right where you are supposed to be. You. you are right where you are supposed to be. Don't doubt it. Don't question it. Just know it for yourself. Know it for yourself. Yeah. You're right where you're supposed to be. And you're loved. I love you. I love you too. Thank you so I much. I love you back. I love you back. All right, you guys. I will see you next week. Stacy. thank yes. you so much. I'll be back on Warrior Wednesday, and I'll see you on April the 22nd, girl. And then after the show, maybe you and I can get on the Zoom and share a little champagne or do a little sa sa sa. Gotta have a whole little spread going on. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. We have to have some sort of virtual rap party. That's yeah. what we need to do. We need to have a virtual rap party. So from the UK to the United States, California, and New York, all these people are here to tell you thank you and we love you. And until next time, I will see you again soon. Okay. Thank you, my darling. All right, everybody. I will see you soon. Bye, Stacy. Wow. That is, you guys, when I tell you the power of words, the power of being a woman, the power of her truth, isn't she sweet? Just her sweetness and her softness um, and all of those wonderful things. Thank you so much for writing that poem in the comments for us. Thank you so much again to Stacy for joining in and for sharing your transparency, your heart, your truth, your womanness with us. So I will see you guys next week for another Warrior Wednesdays, April 22nd. I will see you at United for Resolve. I love y'all. I love y'all. And I'll see you next week. Mwah!